to this Sologeny Pandorata root bowl cleanup video that will incorporate a story, a memory, from back in the days when I used to be in Kenya. And we're going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro today. How about that? Didn't expect that, did you, when you woke up this morning? That you will be going up the highest mountain in Africa, huh? Yeah, what a beautiful place that is. Oh, well, before I get into that, Sologeny Pandorata has been in Lekka and self-watering for over two years. It was time for a cleanup. It was also time to bump up the pot size because she was outgrowing her previous pot. But you can also see that in my previous repot, all it was was an up pot. So in three years, she's been doing pretty well in this setup. I even left the old microfiber inside the root ball because she is a big orchid. She's a thirsty orchid. And when she gets to growing those massive structures, she drinks quite heavily. So I left the microfibers in there. And now I'm going to be peeling out the microfibers and giving this at least a little bit of a cleanup. Although I'm very, very tempted to not even bother because I don't see much decay or death in here. <laughs> I have a video linked below that has everything about the pH. Did the pH measuring of what goes on in the pot and whether decay will show up as the pH drops when you do a two hour soak. I've got that video linked in case you're interested. Some very interesting results. But the conclusion I have here is that the drop in my pH was not due to the fact that I've got decay in the pot, which is something that would be measured as well, because any decay would turn the pot climate acidic. But um, people, people, there's not much decay going on. So I don't know, should I do my Kilimanjaro trek today? Let's give it a go. Let's just get started and let's see how far we get. So basically, I used to go to school in Kijabi, a school called the Rift Valley Academy. It's a boarding school, and it's right on the escarpment of the Great Rift Valley, hence the name Rift Valley Academy. So the juniors and seniors of that high school, we could go on field trips that had nothing to do with Easter or anything like that. And we could choose different locations and trips that we wanted to deal with. Our parents would pay some kind of a detail amount of fee, not the full fee for any kind of trip like that, seeing as we were a missionary school, we got quite a few benefits and advantages um, by saying, you know, these are missionary kids. I wasn't one of them, but I just happened to go to school there. And from all these locations, I chose to go to uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. I chose to climb that mountain. And in my senior year, that's another story. I went up to Lake Turkana and, well, interacted there where I got bitten by a scorpion, but that's another story. Anyway, so leaving Kijabi and getting to the Tanzanian side of the mountain, because back in my day, there was no route on the Kenyan side to go up the mountain. Now there is. Back in my day in 84, there was one trail, one trek to get from the base all the way to the summit. Obviously, that's the one we chose. Kilimanjaro, even though it is always seen from the Kenyan side, because that is the most uniform, the most popular view when you look at pictures, it is in Tanzania. It was a gift from Queen Victoria back in the day to one of her sons or brothers. I don't know what. It was a wedding present to one of her family members. And the Kenyan border actually should be a straight line with Kilimanjaro on the Kenyan side. So when Queen Victoria gave Kilimanjaro away as a wedding present, turns out that our border changed into a kink that you see, and that kink is exactly where Mount Kilimanjaro is. So yay, thanks to Queen Victoria, the highest mountain in Africa is no longer in Kenya, which is a bummer, to be honest with you. And I'm not going to go into the politics of anything, but you know, just like taking the rock of Gibraltar, um, just give it back to the Spanish, you know? I mean, for real. Anyway, so we're leaving Kijabi and we're going all the way to Moshi, which is our first stop. <laughs> Went through some super interesting terrain to get there. We had our school, like a Rosa van, we used to call it, little mini bus. And it took maybe two days. Well, it felt like two days. Maybe it was a one day trip, but that's not here nor there. And we got to Moshi. And from Moshi, we went to Marangu, because that is the little village where the actual gate of the entrance to the Kilimanjaro National Park is. And that is also the starting point of getting up the mountain. Back in the day being, once again, the only starting point. So it wasn't as busy as what I can gather it to be there now, but 
we had about, oof, I think 21 or 22 juniors and seniors in our group. And we were packed up with, you know, sleeping bags, everything that you also need for the winter, hiking shoes. Because basically, going up Mount Kilimanjaro is not like, you know, climbing a huge massive mountain and you need all this kit and caboodle with spiky shoes and all that business. You needed your sleeping bag and you needed a change of clothing that would range from tropical rainforest, then you go into a tundra-like climate, and then all the way up to the snowy, icy, cold temperatures, which is, of course, 5,895 meters, if I'm not mistaken. And usually a trip like this, you can do it in five days. We took, if I don't mistake it, I think we took seven days because altitude sickness is a problem and if you get up into those higher realms and are not accustomed to being in such high altitude you're gonna get ill very very quickly and ill as i mean the pressure is then affecting the brain and you can get dizzy nauseous vomiting lose your orientation and your bearings you can get hallucinations and if that is not dealt with very very quickly as in you reduce the altitude that you're at then you're in big, big trouble, even up to death. So it's not the joking matter. It's not like, you know, you can just trek up there, up and down in five days. So it took us a week up and down in total. But down at the gate, let me just get back to the entry of getting up the mountain. Let's just get that started. <laughs> I get carried away, sorry. Down at the gate, everybody was assigned like a porter for their kit and caboodle. Now I had my whole backpack. I mean, it was one of those massive hiking backpacks and it weighed, I would like to say 55 kilos. I'm not entirely sure, maybe 55 pounds, seeing as I was in an American school. I'll put up the weight when I figured it out during editing. It was heavy, okay? So let's just say it was heavy. And every participant of this trek of ours from our high school was assigned a porter to help carry the load, seeing as none of us were accustomed to ever having done that before. I felt adventurous, I felt confident, and I said I don't need a porter. I'm going to be carrying my stuff all by myself. Thank you. I'm going to be fine. And I was. And we'll get to that. <laughs> But others would have a porter and then we had our guides we got our instructions and we got ourselves a branch that has been well worn as a walking stick which is awesome tall thing fantastic we were ready to go lots of sunscreen was unnecessary during the first day of our trek from the Marangu gate up to the first hut which is the Marandara huts because it was like we were walking through a tropical rainforest it was hot and steamy but here's the thing and I couldn't <laughs> I mean I did make the decision to carry my own backpack sleeping bag and everything yes that was my choice <laughs> we were like walking on a road one of those dirt roads you know and you could see tire tracks and i kind of was like well, what's the point of this exercise if cars can get up here why are we walking <laughs> anyway i don't know i guess that's all part and parcel of the adventure i don't know why maybe some other people paid more money and they could be driven up to the first hut because the first hut is about 2700 meters I don't know. I think so. But it took us quite some time to reach the first hut, which is the first phase or the first destination that you want to be at because you can spend the night in those huts. Not like they were anything fancy. It was just wooden bunk beds and uh, no mattress, no blankets, you know, sleeping bags and all that good stuff. Some people had tents and we did meet some people that were coming down the mountain or we met some people as well that were not doing so well at high altitude and they were being carried down the mountain at a fast Fast paced by one of the porters. This was in another group, but anyway, all these things we were confronted with. At least we could make ourselves our snacks in those little huts and we could sit outside and enjoy ourselves. It was quite, quite amazing. Any pictures I may show, they might not be in order, but it gives you an idea of where we were and what we were doing. I don't have a full, full record of the entire climb and descent, but anyway. So our first night was there. For me, it wasn't that chilly just yet. But eventually, in the morning, rise and shine, make your chai, that is uh, Kenyan tea. Make your chai and off we go for the second leg of our climb. We need to get to the second grouping of huts before nighttime because 
that is where the altitude would change radically and that is where we would probably spend a day and a half maybe it was two days there i'm not quite sure maybe it was just one day but the next station was called horombo huts or camp and we went up there the first thing of that second day on the mountain though was that we were still in the tropical rainforest but then bit by bit the vegetation started to change and we came into like you know gorse scrubby kind of terrain like there was just little tundra bushes around or something like that little alpine kind of vegetation and forgive me for not being able to describe exactly the vegetation it was just not a rainforest anymore it wasn't hot and steamy anymore suddenly the air was crisper it was drier and it started to rain a little bit which was nasty because we got not only soaking wet and it was a little bit too cold for it to be raining like that but it was also difficult walking the terrain wasn't rocky or even we had to navigate our way over like grassy mounds that were kind of slippery and pretty dangerous and uh yeah i'm gonna keep repeating myself i got my backpack on getting up mount kilimanjaro it's just a pleasant walk if you want to say pleasant but anyway so the terrain changed, the weather was miserable in parts, but we made it to Horombo Huts, which was a blessing because I was exhausted. I took off my backpack the second day and I couldn't believe the pain I was in. Oh my word. It felt as though the straps had gone straight through my shoulders. I felt as though my back had just been hit by a truck. I felt bruised, battered and broken. Of course I wasn't, <laughs> it's was just, I was in so much pain. Now, being in a missionary school, there was absolute control as to how the guys mixed with the girls, you can imagine. So, you know, the rule book said we weren't allowed to hold hands with our significant others if we had them, let alone back rubs. But I couldn't care less. I was lying on one of the beds. I, di I didn't want to sleep in a bed. I had no intention of sleeping in bed, but I was lying face down just to get some pressure off my back. It was so painful. And one of the guys came over and gave me a back rub, which I hate, by the way. I hate massages. Do not touch me. I am, ugh, yuck. And it was kind of nice. It was kind of relieving, but it was too painful even just to have somebody like you know get the spasms out of my muscles it was awful so it and it was painful and I wasn't getting any relief as such so before one of our teachers even had a chance to come and say eh, you guys aren't supposed to be doing that sorry for that voice but it's true <laughs> I was done with it but uh, yeah the pain was astounding but what was amazing about the Horombo huts was that for the first time our water when it was boiling wasn't really really hot that was fascinating that was a new one for me I'd never experienced that before and on top of that it has the world's highest toilet <laughs> at least back in the day that's what we were told there is one of the huts, the huts being A-frames, simple A-frames. It's as if they took the structure of a tent and said, yep, we're going to put wood around that. It wasn't anything fancy. It was effective, though, to at least to protect from the cold night. But having said that, so was the outhouse. <laughs> and I don't know if it's changed at this day and age. I wish I had a picture. I can tell you it wasn't just the highest outhouse. It was the one with the most beautiful view I have ever, ever seen. <laughs> Going to the toilet was, um, let's just say, well, I have some pictures from Google Earth, but I'm, I'm going to try and relay this. From one of the huts, you had to sort of trek amongst that, you know, tundra kind of vegetation. There was a path leading down to an A-frame that wasn't as defined or as big as the A-frame where we could sleep. So it was like a replica, but in small. And it was perched over a cliff edge. <laughs> Of, of the side of the mountain and you um yeah you kind of squatted and did your business there just like that and well let me tell you something i am not afraid of heights i never have been never will be but it was super interesting squatting down and seeing <laughs> the terrain underneath i'm sorry if this grosses anybody out but you just have to i have to kind of elaborate on that because it was it I, it's something i have never 
ever experienced and I've never ever done since. I had to do it one more time when I came back down from the mountain, but <laughs> the most beautiful view ever. And you could see when you stepped out into the structure and closed the door, you could see that as you were stepping over that little gap between the structure and, you know, terra firma, <laughs> the drop. And then you were there and you're like going, if this is how I'm going to die, then it's the most beautiful sight in the world. Incredible. You could see as far as the eye could see. You could see all the fields and all the different terrains, the trees and how it changed and the ridge where the whole vegetation changed. And then you could see far out into the Tanzanian savannah. It was just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't so freaked out about the position that you were in and, you know, it could be precarious just because the structure was the way it was built, <laughs> you might have had a really good time and thought, I'm going to stay here and enjoy this. <laughs> oh, meanwhile, people are banging on the door saying, Oh, are you done? <laughs> that was amazing. Horombo Huts. If you ever, ever go, you got to go. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> So we spent the night at Horombo Huts. And then the next morning, day three, we trekked up across the tundra, but what we call the saddle. There's two mountains that you can see, well, two volcanoes that you can see, which is with, uh, with Kilimanjaro. The smaller one is called Mawenzi, and the tall one, of course, is Kilimanjaro. So you kind of have to get around and, you know, you see Mawenzi before you even ever see Kilimanjaro. You, I mean, you you're heading towards the side of this mountain. You are on the mountain, but you haven't even seen the summit yet. Super interesting. Anyway, but then you come up, after you've come to the Horombo huts, you come up to the what is just, you know, lava, sulfur kind of terrain that has absolutely, well, not that I could see, vegetation at all. There's nothing. So that was also very interesting. And it was a little bit chilly and quite windy up there because it's what we called the saddle. Mawenzi. Kilimanjaro big and in between the flat land there it's the saddle and the saddle was pretty much exposed <laughs> now what I told you you should go in Horombo hut if you need to go you go when you're at Horombo hut because the exposed part of the saddle and then you need to go and you've got a party of 23 or 25 people, us including teachers, and the porters had already, you know, dashed ahead. And you got to go? Now what? <laughs> and of course, you're supposed to be drinking a lot of water. You're thirsty. And even though it's cold, people always encourage you, drink, drink, drink. Because as you're acclimating, dehydration cannot happen. It will also interfere with how your brain can tolerate the different elevations and you are adjusting to it. Drink, drink, drink. And everybody had to pee. <laughs> Where do you go? What do you do? We are at a missionary school. How do we go about this? Well, there is one cluster of rocks and I cannot believe that I found that cluster of rocks on Google Earth. They haven't gotten rid of that cluster of rocks. It was like one big one and then maybe three or four little ones <laughs> surrounded. I mean, they weren't there for the natural business of a human being. They were there because of, you know, prehistoric eruptions. P put them there, so to speak. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that was the only kind of privacy protection that anyone had when it came to, you know, if you got to go, you go here, you go now. But then, look, back in the day, the whole thing about littering was, it just didn't occur for us to think about it, which is, you know, I'm glad that we've changed our approach and attitude, especially with what I hear now, how careful they are on Kilimanjaro now to take everything they take up the mountain, they bring it back down. Back then, yeah, I have to admit, there wasn't much of that going on. So in hindsight, I'm feeling a little bit embarrassed and a bit ashamed that I wasn't as aware back then. And uh, yeah, do what you do and you leave it, including toilet paper. And I can tell you that a lot of other people were using those rocks as a little bit of privacy screening to do their business. And um, yeah, that was a little bit like, I mean, we laughed our heads off, but you know, in hindsight, you're thinking not cool, not cool at all. So I'm hoping that whatever measures they're implementing now that they are actually working and being respected. But anyway, we did our business by the rocks on the saddle of Mount Kilimanjaro. I have left my mark there. 
for eternity. <laughs> my footsteps may have been eroded by now, but my DNA is on that mountain. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so by the time, the idea being to cross that saddle as fast and as safely as possible and get to the next dwelling kind of hut, which would be our resting place, eating place, before climbing up the summit, that's called the Kibu, Kibu Huts. And then, you know, that would be our last little area, get some rest. Because the climb to the summit would happen at midnight, because you don't want to be seeing the top that looks so close, you would think that you can reach it within hours. You want to fool your brain and not get discouraged. It's a psychological thing to climb to a summit at night, I guess. So I was told. But I got a bit ahead of myself with the boulder rocks things there. By the time you come by Mount Mawenzi, right there, and you're coming up from the ridge and reaching the saddle, that is where you will see the summit. Either you've got snow on or just a little bit of snow, but that's the first time that you see the summit where you're actually headed. So anyway, reaching Kibo, that is where boiling water wouldn't boil. Well, it was boiling, but it was like only 60 degrees Celsius. It wasn't even boiling temperature. So we had some chicken soup where the noodles wouldn't cook through. <laughs> our tea was, you know, lukewarm, mediocre. And uh, the only thing that happened was our toothpaste froze. <laughs> Somebody said, sleep with your toothpaste, sleep with your camera gear. I didn't have any of that. I mean, I had toothpaste, but I didn't have camera gear. I wasn't a fancy student, but everybody was told to sleep with everything that they had. Otherwise it would freeze over. And well, Nina just thought that was ridiculous. I'm not sleeping with my toothpaste. <laughs> my back was still killing me. So yeah, my toothpaste froze clearly. And I had to borrow some toothpaste. And then I had to hack through a barrel of fresh water outside to brush my teeth with ice water. It was disgusting. I mean, when I went to visit my grandmother in Germany in the snow and in the winter and Christmas, that all made sense. Ice in Africa? No, nope, not so much. And then going to the bathroom there? Oh my word. It was another one of those structures, but it wasn't on a cliff. It was cold, yet I have a picture. I don't know if I can find it, but I have a picture of me outside the toilet. <laughs> at Kibo Huts, <laughs> freezing, just standing there so cold in all the sweaters that I could find because I lived on the coast. I don't have winter clothing. So I was like gathering from anybody that had sweaters, hoodies, you name it. It was just a whole miscellaneous affair I was dressing my body with just to stay warm. I wonder if I can find that picture. I don't know. If I do, I'll put it in the video. If I don't, and in future reference, if I find it, I will post it on the community post. But anyway, yeah, going to the toilet there made me want to get back down to Horombo to go back to that cliff edge toilet. <laughs> so I'm not going to be cleaning my Sologeny any further. I'm going to put her on water and I will continue talking to you just to finish the story because I don't want to be cleaning too much. She's perfectly fine. I don't have many dead roots, but I'm not going to caption this off and then start rushing and all that. We're going to finish climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and then we'll pot up the Sologeny. All right, so the next thing was then at midnight, everybody was woken up. Not that anybody really slept because from six to midnight, you know, nobody is asleep at 6 p.m. <laughs> but it was a midnight climb and we were all gathered outside to for the final push to the summit. And you could see the summit. I'm like, so this is a pointless exercise. I thought we were doing this at midnight so that we don't see the summit and get any kind of, you know, psychological setback or discouragement. And you can tell that I was finding a reason to be grumpy because I am not. Get me up too soon when I'm just about to fall asleep. I'm not really that happy of an individual. <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, we're gathered outside. We were ready to go. And this is where I suddenly felt alive, energized, enlightened, and literally enlightened because the summit, the climb was without a backpack. And guess who had been carrying their backpack all the way up to Kibu Huts? Me. But that was the final push with the walking stick. And everybody else had had their backpacks carried for them. And now they were doing the final push to the summit in the same 
status quo, so to speak, as what they've been hiking up the mountain with all this time. Suddenly, like I said, I felt enlightened. I could walk, no issues. My load was lighter. I had a distinct and clear advantage above everybody else that did not have the same relief the way I did now with no backpack on me. It was amazing. The only thing that stopped me from getting up that mountain fast was the fact I couldn't breathe. Oh my word. I couldn't breathe. The oxygen being so, so low. I'm, I was, I felt like I was suffocating with every single step. So what we did was go up the mountain in a snake kind of curvature. Instead of going up straight, of course, getting up the mountain, doing serpentine kind of walking. So we'd, we'd go up, turn, up. And our guide in front of us had a rhythm chant going. That was the rhythm we were to walk at. And it was the most beautiful, inspiring, painful, don't know what I'm doing here. Please let me make it. I want to get up there. Middle of the night, African starry sky, Milky Way, and I'm getting goosebumps. There was no wind. It was calm. The skies were clear, and because it was so clear, and because of the moonlight and all the stars, that's why we could see the shadow of the summit, and it felt like it was within reaching distance. But then, on top of that, the chant of the guide that was leading us up, and we were like ducklings filed in a row behind him. He had a, a musical, a rhythmic chant that was to make every step in rhythm and in sync so that we would be gaining ground. And you'd think we were gaining ground, but what we were walking on, I would say, felt like lekka, feet deep. So you would take a step and you would slide. You'd take another step and you would slide. It felt like every step forward, all you were doing was sliding with every single step. It wasn't like you were gaining ground. There was no, nothing to, there was nothing secure underneath your feet. It was astounding. And then you're trying to gasp for air. Your lungs are screaming. It's, it's amazing. And then you know what happened? <laughs> you can do this if you want to. <laughs> Little old lady with her sticky branch there, with her guide comes marching past us. I don't know how old she was back then. Anybody that was older than 50 was old in my books. She <laughs> comes la 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 up the mountain to overtaking us in the squiggly line. And here we were. La 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 with step by step gasping for air. And here comes this little old lady with her guide and up the mountain she goes like there's no tomorrow, overtaking us as if she were the Ferrari and we were in a tuk-tuk, you know, that kind of thing. She had an oxygen mask on. <laughs> it's just not. We are so dumb. <laughs> and then <laughs> we're trying to keep up with the rhythm and the pace that our guide had set for us. And we all kind of like just burst out laughing with oxygen that we didn't have. It was... Oh, it was so comical. I cannot believe it. So <laughs> we had a resting point, like an intermediate point. There is a cave. Oh, Josh Meyer, Joseph Meyer, Joseph Meyer. I don't know. There's a cave where you can rest before then the next half, the final leg up to the summit. So we did get a break there. And there she was, the little old lady sitting there chomping away on a sandwich in the dark <laughs> with a little bit of <laughs> light that shone in through from our guide's headlamp. She was just there, happy as Larry, having a sandwich. And then she put her oxygen mask on and was off again. <laughs> she was on a mission. I'm telling you. <laughs> and here come the youngsters, 17 years old, and the faces are haggard, tired, and you can see the pain on everybody's face because the lungs just, <gasps> we were gasping for this air that just wasn't around. Anyway, <laughs> so we had our break and then we pushed up to get up to, it's called Gilman's Point now. But for me, back in the day, it was called Kibo Point. And there are three summits, but they're, the ones that were back in my day were relevant is Kibo Point. That would mean you had made it and you have your certificate. But there's another point that is even higher, the actual, the final height, the final point, and that is called Uhuru Peak. 
Uhuru in Swahili meaning independence, freedom. So the push to Kibo point, and if you made it there, was actually the fact you had climbed Kilimanjaro. There was no need to go to Uhuru Peak, which was another, what, 45 minutes around the crater at a slight incline. But everybody was eager to get to Kibo Point. So by the time we got to Kibo Point and you could turn around, we were dying. If I close my eyes and I look around, I can see bodies just lying left and right. When somebody said to them, you've made it to Kibo Point, it's like they just sank and collapsed onto their knees, rolled over, laid on their back and tried to breathe. But then something else took our breath away. And that was the sunrise, the most amazing sunrise of my life. And once again, I've got goosebumps. Sitting on the peak of that mountain, looking out over the African plain, watching that sunrise. You could see the curvature of the earth and just watching how the darkness turned to dark orange, maroon color, how the African plain turned from orange to a bright yellow to a pale yellow and watching that sun come up. And I am so grateful that we didn't have any cloud cover. It was beautiful 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 and well yeah took a breath away again something else but for all the right reasons anyway took about 30 minutes to get some recovery and some sunrise and people then you know were saying okay we're heading down the mountain and that would be it i'm saying i what after all this 30 minutes up here and now we're going down no you are kidding me and it turns out that normally you get to kibo and then you go back down Turns out there was another group that had already climbed the mountain. They had a rest and they were heading to Uhuru Peak. I just said, you've got to be kidding me. I am not going down this mountain if I cannot get to Uhuru Peak. That's just not going to happen. And of course, being in a missionary school and being under the supervision of a teacher, etc., etc., there was a small discussion as to whether we were allowed to go and join that group to get to Uhuru Peak, seeing as one teacher would have to go down with the students that were going down, and then another teacher would have to make the decision, are they gonna come with us? Because we're not supposed to be splitting up. And I get all those rules, I understand them, but at this point in time, I was like, I am not leaving this mountain if I don't have the chance to get to Uhuru Peak. If I don't make it on my own, fair enough, but at least I tried. Then there was, of course, a quick vote. Who wants to go to Uhuru Peak, blah, blah, blah. And there was, I think, four or five of us that said, yeah, we want to go. And luckily, luckily, we had a reasonable teacher with us. And he said, we're going to go. We're going to take you there. I don't remember the name of my teacher that was the, the reasonable one. But he said, OK, we're going to split up. Everybody who wants to go to Uhuru Peak, we're going this way. Besides, there was already a group that was going to go. So it's not like there's only a few people. If something were to go wrong, there would be assistance and help, etc because getting to Uhuru Peak meant going around the trail of the crater. And I'm telling you, that is not wide. It may be two, three feet, a meter, in some cases a little bit less, and then there's a sheer lecker drop, <laughs> lecker material-like drop, all the way down into the crater. So, I mean, it wasn't an easy decision, but I was so, so glad that this teacher made the exception and said, okay, fine, we're going to split up. This is what we're going to do. And I couldn't believe that some of my schoolmates were actually going to go and leave the mountain and not take this opportunity to go higher. I couldn't believe it. The only thing I had a problem with, I didn't have any more energy. I was in so much pain. My chest was hurting so bad and I felt very, very weak. It turns out that the group that was trekking up to Uhuru Peak that allowed us then to be able to grow in a bigger group, they were German. And one of them gave me mango juice, the concentrated stuff, you know, the really sweet, icky stuff. And I was like, do you know when you see Asterix and Obelix? <laughs> Let's say Asterix is drinking the magic potion and then he does this with his feet and he gets all the power and the energy and he's like ready to go, ready to go. That that is what happened in my body when I had two or three sips of mango juice. The energy just came surging back in. It was just, a, I just needed some sugar. Doing just water in a bottle wasn't going to cut it. It was the sugar in that mango juice. I felt it go through my body and I was so energized. I was like, <laughs> let's go. So we went around the ridge. We passed all the 
obstacles and <laughs> watched pebbles go down into the crater. It was really, it wasn't an easy little trek, even though it wasn't altitude changing to that degree that made it difficult. It was trying to stay on your feet with as little oxygen in your lungs that you've ever had in your life, trying not to faint, focusing on the chanting of the guide because that was still going on so that your mind has something to rest on and focus on and don't fall. <laughs> Those were the criteria. But then we got to Uhuru Peak. There's a cross up there and it has all these little, little banners and mementos and flags and things, just small mementos. It's not like a huge carnival atmosphere up there. Nobody has room for carnival, <laughs> but um, you know, people that have been there have left a rock or have carved their name in the cross. You know, the, the typical thing when you reach a summit, I didn't have anything to leave behind except my DNA, <laughs> again. <laughs> but, but let me tell you, when we got up there, somebody had the wherewithal to bring a guitar, sat around the stones of the cross at the peak of Kilimanjaro, Uhuru Peak to sing the song Kilimanjaro. I I cried. <laughs> I cried. <laughs> I cried maybe for so many reasons, <laughs> for all the reasons that you can imagine. The roller coaster of emotions that were there, the pain as well, the happiness that I'd actually made it, and then to have that Kilimanjaro song play by guitar, a cappella, on the top of a mountain. I'm just, I, you know, you, you, you can touch heaven up there. You really, really can. But then, <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I hope you're not bored. But then while we were up there as well, this German group of people, <laughs> they opened cans of beer and it was none other than the Bavarian beer Löwenbräu. The best beer, as far as I'm concerned, Back in the day was Löwenbräu. Now I would prefer a Warsteiner, but never mind. All I can say is that I was tempted to take a swig. <laughs> I, I shall not lie. But of course, again, missionary school. <laughs> um, yeah, I was high anyway, because I had no oxygen in my lungs. So we got the giggles anyway. No need for a giggly person to get more giggles. We were drunk on the lack of oxygen. And then I thought, well, add beer to that. I'm gonna get in so much trouble back at school. They won't make a spectacle of me here, but they won't forget. And I don't want any problems when I get back to school and stuff like that. So there was a German trekking group had schlepped up beers and of all beers that were there, it was the white and blue Bavarian Löwenbräu. <laughs> I couldn't, I just couldn't. <laughs> German, Bavarian, Löwenbräu, the guy with the guitar singing Kilimanjaro. I'm giggling my guts out because I was drunk on the lack of oxygen. It was all just one big experience. It was heaven. <laughs> we were all the way up there. We were in heaven. Anyway, you know, all good things come to an end and then we took the trek down. And considering how difficult it was to get up, Going down and sliding on what is similar to Lekka was the easiest thing because you could take one step, sink into the stuff and slide part of the way. Take another step, sink into it and slide another way. So with two steps, we had probably covered a distance of 10 meters. <laughs> Whereas before we were going, oh, 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 all the way up. This was just fun. And then we stopped halfway and we did lava rock angels on the side of Mount Kilimanjaro. We were just having so much fun because by now we had too much nitrogen in our system. <laughs> our teacher was trying to hustle us down the trek and we're like, you know, we were in no hurry to leave, but it was also a lot of fun sliding down the mountain with these giant steps and you've got this whole gaggle of giggling students. What a trooper that teacher was though, I must say. So yeah, going up the mountain, let's just say we were, it took us six days going down it was like a day and a half. Nothing, nothing in comparison, but it was brilliant. Now, if you're still here, thank you very much. Let me tell you a secondary effect of going up a mountain. The colder it gets, of course, the odor isn't as intense. <laughs> you know where I'm headed with this one. Not once in my story did I mention that we had a shower, right? Right. <laughs> 
he didn't shower for six days. So by the time we were coming back down onto temperatures where odors started to permeate and hair started to look greasy, you can imagine the state of us by the time we got down and what the bus smelled like. <laughs> Whereas before on the summit, we were all hugging each other without a care in the world, without a smell in the world. By the time we got down, not even 24 hours later, it was like, stay away from me. <laughs> across, across all of us, I tell you. But we had to sit side by side in the bus and somebody took their woolly cap off and we were like, no, don't put your cap back on, you know. <laughs> It's too hot for a woolly cap. Put your cap back on. <laughs> oh my goodness. And then there's just one more thing. It took a couple of days, but once I got back to my boarding school, back to the dorm and whatever, there was one distinct shower that I do remember. Well, the first one, I mean, everything that came off was red. The water was colored red. So that was the first shower. It was nice, whatever, but you know, it was a shower and we removed all the red soil that had gathered and accumulated on us throughout the days up on the mountain. But there was one distinct shower that I will never forget for the rest of my life was maybe five or six days after coming back from the mountain, we were back at my school. And, um, you know, I never had a problem with getting a tan or anything like that because I came from the coast, I was always tanned. I didn't see any difference between how much sun I got, how much sun I didn't get. I was just a tanned person from living on the coast. But I can tell you, I must have gotten quite a bit of sun on that mountain because when I went to wash my face, it's like the whole face came off in my hand and I had skin all over my hands. And then I started to wipe my face again and more of it was coming off. And I'm like, what is this? This is five, six days later, the last thing you think of, well, in my case, I didn't think I was gonna peel. I had no blisters, I had no sunburn, nothing ever would give me the feeling that I had had a lot of sun, where I would say, yeah, this is me peeling. But the peeling wasn't like, oh, look, I'm peeling, I had a bit of sun. This was as if the epidermis had come off like a silicon mask or a prosthetic in a movie. Incredible, it freaked me out. <laughs> it was like, okay, will it hurt now if I put my face back into the water? And it didn't, it didn't hurt, but it seemed like a whole layer of leather had come off. And then of course, when you're done, you look into the mirror and you're checking yourself out and you've got patches everywhere because it's not coming off evenly. Oh, <laughs> it was just, that's just as a little anecdote, a side note. Yes, I walked around looking a little bit panda-eyed for a couple of days until even up to the hairline everywhere it had kind of peeled off and things were back to an even shade. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to pot up my Sologeny Pandorata and if you want to stick around also for that, I appreciate your time very, very much. Thank you. Um, I hope this wasn't too long-winded. I had a great time with this story and I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Let's pot up Pandorata here. She deserves to get back into a pot before I lose the roots. All right, let's get down to business. <laughs> I have to somewhat snap out of the recollection phase now and reprogram my brain to potting up phase. But what I'm going to do here is, seeing as this pot is so big, let me check the size for you. There is no size. Of course, there. yes, there is a size. It's 27 centimeters. Anyway, it is big and it's going to last for another two years. The only thing I don't like about this pot, being a Sologeny, they are not deep rooters. So uh, there's a lot of media going in this pot and my roots won't reach all the way down there. But this is what I've got. And space-wise for the winter, this is important because all that I'm doing throughout the summer, it has to fit back into the grow space in the winter. Right, now having said all that, the leka that was at the bottom of the previous pot is not in any way compromised. I'm going to reuse it without sterilizing it. It's going back in for the same orchid, so all good there. But this is brand new leka, recently cleaned, sterilized, boiled, etc. But it hasn't had that long time period to leach. I have measured the pH of the water after a week of it soaking in the water and we are good to go. We are at around 8 pH. And more importantly, the parts per million of this leka only got to 350 and that is 
perfect because I have had this brand leach up to a thousand parts per million after a week. So this is going to go into the bottom of this pot as crocking, seeing as it can leach out even further when I flush this orchid. And one thing I'm going to have to be doing now is filling up the pot, but making sure that my microfiber stands up straight in between all the lecker so that I can keep the wicking efficacy intact because the pot is so deep. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. I am tilting the orchid in such a way that the roots get into the pot straight away. Her light training will continue along the lines of what I've been doing previously. So her new growth is already heading off in this direction. And I will continue to encourage that growth by putting her in such a way that the source of the light is over here coming from this side, bringing my orchid back into the pot and hopefully buying myself more time. But I do want her a little bit lower, making the back bulbs a little bit higher, not because of rot or anything like that, but because I want that rhizome to be a little bit more buried for the roots to grow in without any issues. If there's something about Sologenes in active growth that they absolutely hate is no water, no access to water. They need it like yesterday as opposed to, oh, oops, there's some water here somewhere. Access to water is paramount. This pot is so heavy, the whole table is jiggling. <laughs> I gotta be careful. Just make sure that my orchid is okay, but that I don't lose the table as well. Just gonna flush her through. Anything that shouldn't have settled after doing the submerged potting up method will settle now. It's draining very, very slowly because of course I've got microfibers in the holes. Everything is sort of waterlogged down there, but it is draining out. Considering as I mentioned how much water these orchids need in their time of active growth, today this orchid has had water aplenty. So I'm not gonna pour the rest of my mask into that. You can see there's debris and everything here. I'm gonna take advantage and make sure that that stays out of the pot. And for the coming days, it's okay that the reservoir is only going to have what is draining out right now. I don't need to be putting in any fertilizer at this point in time. There is no fertilizer or supplement uptake after the root system has been so saturated with a lot of water. No need. We're just going to leave her like that for now. And then hopefully, maybe, the new growth will give us some blooms. I really appreciate it if you've watched this video all the way to the end. My goodness, it has been one heck of an adventure for me. I thoroughly enjoyed myself, but that is not what counts. Whether I enjoyed myself or didn't enjoy myself, I sincerely hope that you did as well. I am glad to also to get Sologeny Pandorata in her designated pot. But above everything, I really appreciate appreciate your time and once again sincerely hope that you had a good time. I wish you a beautiful day and from me here in southern Spain to you wherever you may be in the world, I only ask one condition from you and that is that you stay safe please. Take care. Guajerisana. sana.